Welcome to Dare to Leap, a conversation and community supporting women just like you to gain the freedom, flexibility, and financial security you desire and deserve with CEO and founder of Virtual Expert Training, Kathy Guggenauer. This is Dare to Leap, and now here's the powerhouse tiara-wearing Kathy Guggenauer. I am honored to have Joan Satkin here with us today. Joan helps entrepreneurs and practitioners experience freedom from struggling personally, professionally, and financially. She is the expert when it comes to understanding how emotions learned in early childhood can affect a person's business and financial income, financial outcomes. I got to tell you, Joan, we could talk about this all day long because we all have uh, those early childhood, right? <laughs> we wouldn't be here today. <laughs> we all did it. We all were there. <laughs> uh, that's right. Thousands have benefited from her groundbreaking book, Build Your Money Muscles, and her podcast, The Prosperity Show, and her unique holistic style of coaching. Joan, welcome. I'm so excited to have you here today. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I look forward to having this conversation. Well, I think we're going to need about a two or three hour conversation because I already, in, in talking with you for just five minutes, I have a list of about 20 things I want to ask you. Well, go. So let's start somewhere. <laughs> all right. So I want to start, um, and you can, and you can back up on this if you want to and start earlier, but um, what caused you to get so involved in how the early childhood impacted a person's business and financial outcomes? Okay, so in the 1970s, I had two millionaire brothers and I couldn't rub two pennies together. I was wow. the, the sick one in the family. I was the one that always had to get rescued. And I had already been into metaphysics for a long time and had come to believe that we create our own reality. I don't say it quite that way anymore, but that was my belief. And so I wanted to know, well, if they were doing that. Why was I being sick and broke and, and crazy and, and all sorts of things. And I had already started meditating in 1972. And so I was spending a lot of internal time in 1976, I gave away everything I owned because I was trying to figure out what life was supposed to be. I was born in 1940, and the thing was girls should get married and have children. And I got married twice and thought that wasn't my idea of a good time. And so <laughs> <laughs> I had to figure out a different way of defining myself. And, and so, um, and, and so I, I spent all this inner time, particularly when I gave everything away, it was a very inner journey. And I've come to believe that we do create our life stories, but it's, it's not magic that you have to understand how you make your decisions. And what goes into those decisions is your habitual thoughts, beliefs, and emotions, which start in early childhood in response to your environment. Wow, that is so huge. So um, if I ask you something that's too personal, just say. No, I'm, yeah, I'm an open on. book. I got nothing. Okay, about. cool. Joan, <laughs> I feel like you and I are exactly alike because I'm telling you when I see you and you've got your beautiful silver hair and your face is so, you, you're so beautiful. You're so vibrant. And you guys, I don't know if you just caught that number of when she was born, but <laughs> you know, in case you didn't, how old are you now, Joan? I, I'm just about to turn 80. <laughs> 80. If you are not watching this on YouTube, please go look at Joan. You will never in a million years believe she is 80. We look like twins. We look like we're the same age. And I am 63. 
So she's got 20 years on me and she doesn't look a second of it. So how did you go from being that sick person without two dimes to rub together to this healthy, vibrant woman that you are at 80? Well, when I was in my early 30s, a doctor said to me that I would never be healthy because I was just a hypochondriac and uh, I should, should, should get used to all of my physical disorders. And fortunately, I have a very healthy screw you attitude and said, <laughs> <laughs> that's not my story. And I started reading about physiology and microbiology and got into alternative medicine. And I found this endocrinologist who said to me, well, if you give up sugar, you won't be depressed anymore. And I thought, okay. Oh, and I went home, got rid of all the sugar. And within a week, I wasn't depressed anymore. So wow. I, I had proof that there was a, that I didn't have to take Elevil and Thorazine and all these drugs that were, were keeping me from committing suicide. And, and it just opened up another world. And I learned about homeopathy and, and I started going to a chiropractor. And this was way back in 1973. So there wasn't, there was no internet and there wasn't a whole <laughs> lot of information. There was one health food store in Los Angeles where I was living at the time. So uh, once I gave up the sugar, I realized that there was another way to live. And I just went on a health kick. I found out when I was 65, that I have a connective tissue disorder that's genetic that, that was causing most of my problems. So- Wow, um, it took that long to find that out. Right, but in the meantime, I had dealt with all the symptoms from an alternative point of view and had minimized a lot of the problems. I had to go through a lot of surgery and it, physically it's been a, a difficult um, uh, journey. But I learned acceptance and, you know, whatever you've got, you can learn from it. And mm -hmm. so now that I'm turning 80, which is something <laughs> I have a, a trouble understanding, you know, I, I get enough sleep. I eat mostly organic. I walk a mile and a half to two miles a day and I meditate wow. every day. So it, it, the, the answer is easy. It's just not easy to do. And right. in the meantime, it helped me develop an extraordinary amount of discipline because I had to give up sugar, which has never been easy for anyone. I went through a lot of withdrawal mm -hmm. symptoms. And so I really, I, I mean, I, I'm really interested in passing along the money stuff and how we create our, our life stories and stuff. But you have to have the health in order yes. not to get old and sick. And I really believe that a lot of dis-ease is caused by emotions that haven't been expressed. Mm. Uh, there's a whole branch of medicine called psychoneuroimmunology, which is all about the connection between emotions and health. So I, I think that a, a lot of people try to, uh, minimize the aging process by taking this supplement or that supplement. And yes. now I have, I've had uh, uh, genetic, a lot of genetic testing, genomic testing. And so I take a lot of supplements because uh, I, I, I didn't get everything you need <laughs> to thrive. <laughs> you know, so it cost me a couple hundred dollars a month for just the supplements, but look how alive I am. And that's right. And, so, yeah, the, the insurance doesn't pay for the supplements, but now it pays for acupuncture and um, all sorts of things. So the world is getting more open to what the truth is. And I yes. just would like to be a uh, someone who teaches how to do it. It's about well, aging you... without getting old. I have never had a flu shot. This year, I'm going to have to really look at it I've because I've never had the flu. Um, I don't get no sick. No way you've never I, had the flu? 
I haven't, I don't think I've had a cold in 10 years because my immune system wow. is so strong. That's amazing. So give us an example of what kind of food you eat on a regular basis. I know this isn't even really what we're supposed to be talking about. We're going to get around to talking about your business too and finances, but I am so fascinated by this. Joan, I think you might be changing my life today. Okay. Well, good. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I don't eat a lot. Um, we, when I was, when I was diagnosed with hypoglycemia to get off the sugar, I learned how to eat small, frequent feedings. So that, and, and at one point I had to get all this stomach surgery. So, and they left me Gosh. with a normal size stomach that doesn't expand. Um, so, wow. and I don't like that feeling of being full. Yeah. So I don't yeah. eat a lot, but uh, small, frequent feedings. But I, mm -hmm. I, I eat very little animal protein. I eat a lot of vegetables and fruit. And, and now I used to be unable to eat uh, uh, carbohydrates, but I, there's a mm. treatment that I got in Santa Fe called low dose allergen immunotherapy. And wow. I can pretty much eat what I want now. And That's it's fabulous. an amazing experience after <laughs> almost 40 years of not being able to eat this or that or anything else. I can go into a restaurant and not worry about what's in the salad dressing when we had restaurant availability. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Life has changed. Um, yes. and, you know, when people say to me, I can't give up my chocolate, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, it depends upon how you want to feel. And, right. and I still have to deal with the Ehlers-Danlos, which is a connective tissue disorder. Um, but, um, you know, so I'm a little bit too hypermobile and, but I, I've learned to, everybody's got something they have to deal with. Yes. And, and to me, many, a number of doctors have said to me, it's your attitude that has kept you alive. And, uh, you know, it's like with dogs, if, if they lose a leg, then they use the other three, you mm -hmm. know, you use what you've got. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I've learned not to feel jealous about what other people have or don't have. And, you know, I don't compare myself to other people and I don't take things personally. So a lot of it has to do with how we've decided to be in the world. And, and I've decided to be a kind person who has learned to listen because I'm a talker and uh, <laughs> me when too. <laughs> when you're a talker, you have to learn how to listen. Mm, and, yes. You know, I think that as we move along, we get to make a lot of different decisions about who we want to be. And in my world, what seems to me is that the first 50 years is finding out what we're not. Then- <laughs> like that. Th I totally then, agree. Okay. Then That's when what I spent my first 50 years doing. <laughs> okay. And to not judge whatever we did. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then mm -hmm. in the 60s, we begin to ask the question, who do I want to be? And how do I get mm -hmm. there? In mm -hmm. the 70s, you're not as ambitious and you don't care about getting to the end because you've started thinking about the end and you're in no rush to get there. So mm -hmm. your values change about what matters in each, in each decade. In 10 years, I'll tell you what the eighties are all about. <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming back and interviewing you again. I'm going to tell you that right now. Okay. We can go ahead and book it. <laughs> yes. So, um, I'm, you know, I was really sick for 20 years. I could barely get out of bed for a long time. I had killed my adrenal glands and I figured that was my retirement. So, uh, now I, you know, okay. So I, I have no, I, no desire to retire. I don't have mm -hmm. kids or grandkids or, um, I live mm -hmm. alone, which is definitely has been my choice. And and life is just beginning. I mean, this COVID thing is mm -hmm. giving us this pause 
where, you know, if your mind hasn't begun to slow down, it's because you're not trying. (laughs) You know, know, and my goal has always been, and I've reached that point, to not let money determine how I feel and to not worry about anything. And to reach that point is so freeing. It doesn't take a lot of money to do that. It's, It's understanding that, you know, you've gotten this far, you're probably not going to die tomorrow. So you got time to figure things out. I just had sepsis. Do you know what sepsis is? Oh, yes. Okay. So I thought I had only 40% of people survive that. I know. So um, I thought I had COVID because I had the chills. and But then my brain stopped working and I couldn't make a decision. Fortunately, my brother now lives in Santa Fe and he insisted I get to the hospital and I had sepsis. I was in really bad shape. Oh my Two gosh. days later, I left the hospital. Cause wow. And and I went and had two vitamin IVs a week apart. And yeah, awesome. I still have a, a few leftovers. So I'm gonna go for uh, an acupuncture treatment. But um, in the hospital, <laughs> I had this amazing experience. Uh, It's like a mystical experience where I'm totally unable to think or do anything. And I was in the emergency room and I had to stay there for two days because they didn't have a room for me. So when you're in the Mm -hmm. emergency room, you get a lot of attention because Mm -hmm. that's their job. And I'm not crazy about allopathic medicine, but it was real clear to me that they knew how to manage a crisis. And they were dumping all Mm -hmm. those antibiotics Mm -hmm. into my system. And I reached this moment of total surrender. Mm. I was willing to just be there. And I felt loved and taken care of. And Mm. and I had no sense of worry. Fortunately, I didn't know how serious sepsis is. So I could... (laughs) (laughs) That's good. Yeah, yeah. That was a good thing. And, and since then, I've had a whole new sense of, of wanting to move forward with my business. And, and it's just given me actually a new lease on life. I don't recommend se- sepsis as a way to get <laughs> <No>. there. <laughs> no. And, Find and, another way to really relax other yes, than sepsis. <laughs> and everyone has said to me, you really dodged the bullet. But it's because yes. I was so healthy to begin with. No yeah. fooling healthy. And, and yeah. you know, all my blood tests are all, always, you know, perfectly normal. And I'm slightly anemic and have been all my life. But it's, there's a way of living and really living that people mm-hmm. don't understand. You know, yeah. the, not only the diet and the exercise, but a mental attitude of acceptance and satisfaction. Most people have no idea how to be satisfied because the dopamine in their brain is just going, you need more, you need more, you need more. Well, what if you don't? <laughs> yeah. What yeah. If, so for those people who think like that, what can they do to stop well, that? First of all, you have to make a decision. Uh, you have to understand that that need for more is coming from your brain and not from anything logical. And you have to make a decision. I'm going to learn how to tame my dopamine. People are afraid if they're satisfied with what they have, they'll never have any more. The paradox is the more satisfied you are, the more that you actually need to satisfy, you will come along. Because if satisfaction is your habit, that's your brain is gonna keep you in that habit. If disappointment is your habit, you're gonna keep getting disappointment. If dissatisfaction is your habit, you'll never be satisfied. So yeah. it's so people don't understand that they have a choice 
as to how they want to feel. So it's like when you have a disappointment habit, which is very common. And, mm-hmm. and oh my goodness, it is. Okay. So what am I feeling? And, and for women, this is a lot easier than for men. What am I feeling? When have I felt it before? Which will, t- and, and if, if you think about it and think about it, you'll get back to childhood. When you were two, and they never let you have what you wanted. When, if you were brought up poor so that you felt deprived all the time. And when you get back to childhood, how many siblings did you have and what was your birth order? Cause all of those will affect your feeling habits. So when you realize that you're feeling, you have this habit of disappointment, you say, what am I feeling? When have I felt it before? What would I rather be feeling? Ooh. And do I know how to feel that? Because in order to train your brain to create new neural pathways, you have to have a feeling goal. And, and it's amazing to me how many people have said to me, no, I've never felt satisfied. That's very sad. Oh my goodness. That's horrible. <laughs> That's very sad. So do I know how to feel that? And okay, so what would you rather be feeling? Now, if you have a disappointment habit, you might want to feel satisfied or loved or, or ha- this having feeling rather than deprived. And then you have to practice the feeling. Because your brain is just a machine that does what it has been programmed to do. And just like your computer, you can change the program. Go get a different piece of software. But with the brain, it takes time to build new neural pathways. So it's like your thoughts affect your feelings. So do you have... Do you pick on yourself a lot? Do you, do you have negative thinking patterns? So when I was first teaching myself this, you remember there weren't a whole lot of books on how to do this. Uh, when, when I realized <laughs> that I didn't want to be a depressed person and that that was my habit, that I wanted to be in a more positive frame of mind. So when I'd hear myself, and to do this, you have to pay attention to what's going on. When I'd hear myself saying, you know, you should have done that, I would just take a breath and say to myself, thank you for sharing, but we don't talk like that anymore. Ooh, I love that. In other words, you have to interrupt the pattern. Okay. And you have the choice to see uh, whatever you're doing from a different point of view. If you have a lot of negative thinking, then what does it take to turn that into seeing the light rather than the darkness? What I see happening in the United States right now with all the hate and the, the, the conflict, it's as if we're going through this Armageddon where we get to choose between the forces of light and the forces of darkness. And it's our choice. I remember this is how I learned to love Richard Nixon. Um, You know, he was, this was, you know, when he was going through all his Watergate Uh stuff, I thought, well, the, the, the earth plane is a dualistic reality. Every plus has a minus, even on the atomic level. And that I was grateful that he had chosen to live on the minus side, which left room for me on the plus side. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. (laughs) It's all a matter of perspective. And, And you can decide which part of that that uh, thing that you want to belong to. Do you want to be in, in, in the light? Now, does mm-hmm. that mean you have to pretend to be happy all the time? Mm-mm. No, it's a matter of seeing things from a different perspective. 
you know, when I was on my journey, when I had given everything away, uh, if I didn't have enough money for food, I figured I was learning how to fast. And wow. it all depends on how you look at it. <laughs> yeah. And so you have to decide when you look in the mirror, whether you see your wrinkles and your, your, your body isn't like the perfect people who have to work really hard to get to the, be one of the perfect people. <laughs> um, no, thanks, but no, and they that, probably never feel perfect enough. At, exactly. So it has nothing to do with what you look like. It's how mm -hmm. you accept yourself. Um, mm -hmm. Being Joni Sotkin has not been an easy assignment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure many people feel that way about the person, the personhood that they were given. Mm -hmm. But who do you want to be? You know, how do you want to live your life? How do you want to feel? Uh, you know, we're so, in business. We're so focused on. Uh, what should we do? What should we do? How do we set goals? How do we reach our goals? You know, smart goals. I've never been able to get behind that. Um, smart goals. <laughs> well, what about your feeling goals? Oh, what do you want to be feeling? Mm -hmm. If you're at now, if, for example, if you're depressed and you're the way you eat and live is part of the, the cause of your depression. Well, once you decide that you don't want to be depressed anymore and you, and you keep asking the question, how can I get over this? How can I get over this? You will be led to a solution if you can mm. sit quietly long enough to hear what you need to hear. That's why the meditation piece is so important. How long do you meditate on a daily basis? Do you do well, it every day? Well, you know, I ha it's really weird. My 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 meditation practice, as they say, has has is different than it used to be. So mm -hmm. in the morning when I wake up and I'm in that alpha state, I just stay there for anywhere from a half hour to an hour. I'm not trying to accomplish anything. I'm just letting the thoughts go through my mind. I come up with titles of art articles and, you know, and I just have to try to remember what I'm hearing in that silent state. <laughs> and if I wake up in the middle of the night and can't go back to sleep, I know I have to meditate. And that's usually an hour. If I oh, wow. sit down to meditate, it's usually 20 minutes. Okay. Um, if I meditate before I go to sleep, um, it's usually 20 minutes. Uh, so, I hate rules. Oh, no. I can, I, that's awesome because a rule is something I'm going to have to force myself to do. But the way right. you're doing it is you're using meditation to help you with whatever you need help with that day. Exactly. Exactly. I, I went and I, there was a long period of time when I would just go into meditation and sit for a half hour. And mm -hmm. I, and, but I, if it was only 20 minutes, it didn't matter. If it was 10 minutes, it didn't matter. Whatever whatever is mm -hmm. happening. And the way I look at it, you know, they talk about mindfulness and all. I never, I, you know, I had a teacher who just told me to sit quietly and watch my mind, you know, okay. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, we get so hung up in what we're supposed to accomplish and what we're supposed to do. And to me, that meditation time is when I get my instructions. Oh, you know, I love that. And people will tell me that they get that inner voice, but they don't do what it says. Because sometimes it says some really weird stuff. <laughs> you know? Has and yours I, ever said anything weird? Give away everything you own. Oh, yeah, that's right. That was weird. <laughs> I don't have enough money for rent. I don't have enough money. What should I do? Well, the answer is give everything away. Not the kind of, now people would be afraid of that kind of thing. But to me, mm -hmm. I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You're I had a ticket to go back East. I was in California to a family wedding. And so um, before I left, I had a giveaway day. 
and mm. and you know, I put up a, a, a sign in the health food store giveaway day, mm -hmm. and the last person to come was a taxi driver. So I wound no. up getting a ride to the airport the next oh. day. <laughs> wow. And, you know, I really love the concept of synchronicity. When, yes. when you're still, it can happen on so many different levels. And what if it's real? Well, how do we enhance our synchronicity? And one of the things you have to do is be still a certain amount of time. I just did a podcast episode that that posted recently on synchronicity because I want to create the synchronicity method of marketing where you get yourself Ooh. in the right place and then whatever you need shows up because I it, outbound marketing has gotten it's crazy out there the competition it, the, it the the wanting yeah. the the there's a, a feeling of desperation I get yes out there yes. and and I can't do that anymore so. Um, and so far it's working. I have enough to take me through every day. You know, my question to people is, do you have enough food? Do you have enough the place to stay? You got enough. Um, learn the concept of enough. And by, by dedicating myself to allowing synchronicity to happen, I, I get to see life from a very different point of view. Because everyone has got, I mean, there's just too many people. You know, it's like when I first got online 25 years ago, it was really easy to make $1,000. I would just announce a teleclass because there was no Zoom. A teleclass yeah. and uh, for $10 and 100 people would sign up. That was easy. Now mm -hmm. it's, uh, and all the big guy players are in there. So mm -hmm. they don't care what it costs them to run their business. I'm not willing mm -hmm. to, I'm not willing to play the game. And people have become so jaded from all that um, free webinar, free training, low cost this, low cost that, and then get on there and it really isn't a value to them. It's really a sales pitch. And so they're now jaded. And so to try to get people it, even if you have something really good that you want to share with them, it's really difficult to get them to um, participate, to show up for you because they've been so jaded by others. And Do you agree so with that? I Yes. And I had a mail order business. My, my, my mm. big business in the 1980s was a crystal business. I was the first one to market crystals and minerals for healing and meditation nationwide. I, uh, and I had a line of stones called Jones Stones in 600 stores. So I, I got to see that part of, of life. And um, people, I, what was your question? I forget. <laughs> <laughs> How I jaded people have gotten. How jaded they've oh, gotten. Oh, yes. So in the mail order, and, so, and I would send out 50,000 catalogs at a time. When I was really wow. sick and thought I could never get out of the house, I learned mail order. <laughs> That's so had good. How to make a living from home, right? Yeah. So uh, what I learned is in the mail order business is, first of all, you should never innovate, imitate, because if people aren't looking for what you, what you have, then they're not, gonna, they're, they're not gonna be looking for you. The other thing is uh, that mail order buyers are not necessarily radio listeners. It's like, I don't expect my podcast listeners to sign up for what I have to offer. And it's come, I've had the podcast for seven years and I see no matter, if I'm putting a group together and I do a, a commercial for my group every episode, if I get one or two people to sign up, because podcast listeners are not mail order buyers. Mm, yeah. Okay. And they're getting the podcast for free. That doesn't mean mm -hmm. they want to pay you your coaching right. fees because right. yes, they become so jaded. There's so much free information. Mm -hmm. no, so I find that I get clients when people hear me on other people's podcasts, 
and they'll say to themselves, oh, she gets it. And, and mm -hmm. I have a lot of younger people who are attracted to what I have to say because they don't want to drive themselves crazy with marketing, 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 marketing. Um, and I really know marketing. <laughs> I had a mail order <laughs> business and yeah. I just want to sit still and wait for instructions. I love that. I'm going to go listen to that podcast. That appeals to me so much because I really believe in synchronicity and I love the power of it. Just like that taxi driver showing up as your last person for the giveaway. Oh, it's like little things like last winter when winter was starting, I, I put on a jacket um, and, and Santa Fe is a very high allergy city. And I put on a, a jacket that I hadn't worn in that season and I'm walking along and it's freezing cold and my nose starts running. And so I just say out loud, I need a tissue. <laughs> <laughs> and I walk ahead 20 feet and there's a napkin, a personal, perfectly clean napkin on the ground. Wow. And I look at it and I say, is it safe to pick it up? <laughs> <You know? laughs> and I said, of course it is. It just showed up when you needed it. That's and, right. And I picked up the napkin and was able to blow my nose. So that's on a very minor key. Mm -hmm. Okay. The thing is, when things show up, people don't trust it's what you mm, need. Yes. <laughs> they want yes. X. They want X and Y shows up. And they mm -hmm. go, oh, disappointment. I didn't get what I wanted. I got Y mm -hmm. instead of X. <laughs> mm -hmm. But the trick is to understand that you are getting your needs met. You're just not noticing that that's what you need. It's like the giving away of everything I own, where mm -hmm. I had to trust every, you know, what, every day where I had to be. And um, it turned out to be the best thing I ever did. Even though my father stopped talking to me, my mother said, just call me once a week so I know you're still okay. And people thought I was nuts. And I was. <laughs> I think you still are in a great way. I love your nuttiness. Yeah. Well, now, you know, I've learned it's okay to be different. Um, I love being different. And actually, talk about childhood experiences. We were the only Sotkins in the whole country. Wow. There's a lot of Sutkins when, when the people came over from an, on an Ellis Island and they said, my name is Sutkin. They wrote down Sutkin. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. And my father, who was nuts, um, I'm sure he was <laughs> borderline personality or something. And he had all these rules for Sutkins. So Sutkins can't sing. Sotkins don't feel, so, you know, and so my brothers and I call it the curse of the Sotkins. So my, the fact that my brother's appendix were on the left side instead of the right side, we call that the curse of the Sotkins. <laughs> when the doctor tells me that I've got an unusual ear canal, I say to him, oh, that's the curse of the Sotkins. It's the Sotkins. <laughs> So oh my gosh, we've learned to be outsiders. And here's an interesting point. Most leaders, because I tend to work with leaders, mm -hmm. feel like outsiders. That's how they get mm -hmm. to be leaders, because they're not part of the pack. And they mm -hmm. think there's something wrong with them because they're an outsider. That's just their training to be a leader. Wow, that's so interesting. <laughs> so yeah. accept what you've got. Accept what you've got. The first 50 years are about learning what you're not. You know, I learned I didn't have to be married and have children. You don't have to do that to be satisfied. I would have been. Did you get a lot of pushback uh, back when you made that decision? Well, it, the decision, yes, because the, my first divorce was like in... 1965, somewhere around there. I don't even remember. Mm -hmm. And and it, it wasn't popular to get divorced at the time. 
Right. And, but I knew that I had to get divorced. And at the yeah. time you had to lie in court and say I was beaten. <laughs> you know? Oh my gosh. And to even be able really, to get a divorce. He was, he was really a nice guy. I just didn't want to be married, you know? So yeah. we had to go to court and I mean, it was crazy. Um, yeah. And the second marriage, um, I, I got married cause I was in a terrible place and, but it's what I needed evidently. And it took me a long time to heal from that but that kept me from getting married again. <laughs> <Which> <laughs> then you knew I'm done with that. <laughs> yeah. Right. So to me, that's a piece that's important is the acceptance of what is. Mm, it's yeah. no good or bad. There's only what is. If you're I in really a love that. marriage, you have the choice to get out of it. If, if, mm -hmm. and for women, and I know you work mostly with women. I do. Um, it's understanding that you are equal. Um, and I was called Jonathan for the first 10 years of my life by my father because they wanted a boy. <laughs> they wanted a boy like most oh my good families do. And, and one day when I was much older and I was healing and I said to my father, I really didn't like it when you called me Jonathan. And he said, I just called you Jonathan when I liked you. Well, oh my gosh. How much. <laughs> that no, that no, doesn't, that how that much. doesn't help at all. No, no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so each of our experiences gives us what we need. I wouldn't be working mostly with men now if I hadn't had to learn how to uh, intuit my father and my brother's feelings. I mean, yeah. I believe that whatever you've gone through, whatever you've gone mm -hmm. through is what you mm -hmm. needed to become who you're becoming. And you don't mm. find out what that is until you're 60 or 70. Wow. So um, when you said women are equal and we just need to realize that. Yes. Um, I will tell you that I am married to a man who is 72 and he does not like the fact that I believe I'm equal. He just told me yesterday that I treat him like he is my employee. And I was like, hmm, I treat my employees pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> but remember, I didn't know what to say with that, you know? Remember, people don't like change. And as we start, oh, my changing, husband really doesn't like change. <laughs> and as we start changing, they're going to push back. Mm -hmm. um, because oh, they've yeah. got to protect. They don't, we have to teach others how to deal with who we are. Ooh, how do we do that, Joan? One little step at a time and patience <laughs> <laughs> because words, i i really uh, that you have really hit on something there because this whole time i've been listening to you i'm thinking the universe sent joan to me today i needed joan today i'm i'm serious because i really do believe that and everything you're talking about are the lessons that i have needed to hear so thank you so much for that i really appreciate it and, and when someone says that to me, then I know whatever I've been through is a blessing and not a problem. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. And, that is so powerful. and I've had lots of therapy and I've used the EFT and I wrote the manual for Be Set Free Fast and, you know, all the, and, and it's like, when do you say I'm healthy now? When do you stop saying mm -hmm. I have to heal? Mm. When are you? Willing? Oh, that's a great question. And it's like, when do you learn how to be a healthy person? I had to realize mm. that I had the habits of an unhealthy person. I perceived mm. that one of my basic things that I teach is there's nothing wrong with you that needs fixing. You have habits mm. learned in early childhood that are affecting your decisions and all you need is new habits. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk a little bit about the type of person, a little bit about, um, you know, if somebody's listening to this uh, or they're like me and they're like, Joan is speaking to me. Um, 
I need more Joan. I might want to work with her. Tell us about the kind of people you enjoy working with and how someone would reach out to find out about working with you. Well, first of all, everything is on prosperityplace.com. That's my, my okay. main site. And my podcast, I talk about all this stuff on my podcast. And I'm fascinated by what makes one person successful and another person not. So when I'm interviewing successful people, I want to know why they think they got to where they are. Yeah. You know? yeah. Cause I, I was financially disabled for so long and, and you know, what does it take to change? And so I do all the emotional stuff. So I have lots of free material. Um, my, awesome. my eBooks are like under $10. Um, and, and I'm going to be making new ones and the co for the coaching. I, for some reason, mostly men are attracted to what I talk about. Um, I don't know why I'm not a, a I, maybe because you're so beautiful and they just want to look at you. Well, and it's good that I'm almost 80 because that makes me non-threatening. <laughs> yeah. hey, maybe that's maybe that's another reason seriously because men are yeah. easily oh yeah i'm right? safe in other words yeah they, they may need a benevolent mother um but not one that looks like you know some glamour queen and, mm -hmm. and you know i'm just i look safe <laughs> you, know, you know, I don't have the long I hair. Think, I wouldn't go there. I wouldn't. Okay. I don't okay. think you look safe. I think you look fun. Yeah, and and I tr I have a great sense of humor, right? The, you do. In our family, we never touched each other. We just told jokes, and, oh. and since we were all Capricorns, we just handed each other twenty dollar bills. You know, so. <laughs> 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 uh, have you written a memoir yet? Well, I wrote a book about the journey when I gave everything away. It's called The yes. Search for Connection. And um, I, I kept a diary, a day at a glance diary when I was wandering around because I knew I was in the middle of an interesting story. And mm -hmm. so about six years ago, I guess it was, I started writing the story, which was very cathartic for me. Because what I did, I was I was feeling very alone, and where do I fit it? I mean, it was a difficult journey internally, and yet it was fascinating to me because mm -hmm. stuff would show up, you know, and because I was yeah. in this totally open place, and so the book is basically the story, and a little bit about the family. It could have been a better teaching book, but it's the story, and people tell me it's very inspiring, because. Uh, I was, you know, I, I was doing something that very few people do. So right. that have uh, and the that's to do, available. Even a lot of people want to. Yeah. And that's available on Amazon as a Kindle and a paperback. And the PDF is available on my site. Um, Fabulous. And, and for the, for the coaching, I work mm -hmm. with successful entrepreneurs and it can be male or female. I, you know, they tell you, you got to pick a niche, you know, well, you know, and I'll say. Well, successful I, entrepreneurs is a niche. Yes. But is this a, someone will say to me, well, say men mm -hmm. or women. And, and mm -hmm. I'll say it. And then the opposite shows up, you know. So. <laughs> and you what do you help them do? Okay. What do you help so those successful I help, first do? of all, I help them understand that there's nothing wrong with them that needs fixing that because mm, they that, think there is well every you know yeah very few people have a really strong self image and leaders mm. successful people feel like mm. outsiders mm. and and mm -hmm. and they don't know how to define themselves so we look at you know they actually a lot of people come to me who want to get a better relationship with money. My other book is Build Your Money Muscles, Nine Simple Exercises for Improving Your Relationship with Money. And mm -hmm. someone tells me what's going on with their money, I can tell them what's going on emotionally. I mean, that's that wow. seems to be my superpower. And yeah. and when when I when you know when when I work with someone, the first questions I ask, what did your father do? What did your mother do? 
how many siblings did you have and where were you in the birth order? And mm -hmm. they never give me one word answers. So the story I hear within the first 10 minutes mm -hmm. helps me understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. I don't have a set method. Uh, I, cause I work very intuitively, uh, you know, and I'm surprised yes. sometimes at the questions I ask. Um, <laughs> you know, yeah. I, you can't teach anybody to do it the way you do it because it is all from, from your intuition. Right. And what and you're picking so, up about the person. I um, can feel that from you already. Yeah. And it's like when I do my podcast or when I do an interview, I don't prepare anything. I, I know I'm not going to mm -hmm. run out of things to say. Never have, <laughs> never will. <laughs> Except when I had sepsis that, that I, I couldn't say. Oh, anything. yeah. I couldn't say anything. Two I mean, days, I, two whole days. Well, actually, there were a couple of days before that. And that's when my brother mm -hmm. decided get her to the hospital. Mm, <laughs> thank goodness. Because when yeah. Joan stops talking, we know something's wrong. <laughs> <You know? So. laughs> oh my gosh. That's what my husband says. He goes, I know you're not feeling good because you're not saying anything. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I wait to see what shows up, you know, the, the right, yeah. the right people come, we have a conversation and then we can decide whether it's right or wrong for someone. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, some people are done in three to four months. Other people stay with me a long time because they like who they're turning into. Mm, I love that, Joan. I love that. Well, this has been absolutely amazing. I don't want to let you go because you are fascinating. I absolutely <laughs> love your energy. I love your personality. Well, thank you. So here's what I would like to suggest. Yes. Is that we schedule another podcast because I have like a thousand more questions to ask you. Would you be up for that? Just put a microphone in front of my mouth and I'm a happy camper. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. That sounds good. So for today, we're going to go ahead and call it a wrap. If you're listening to this and you want to hear more from Joan, comment, let us know what is it that you would like to know more about? Um, I seriously, I have a list. I have been writing out a list while we're doing this. I want to know more about, you didn't even talk about your work in Hollywood. I want to know more about those crystals. I want to know more about the vitamin drip. I mean, you just, your life is so fascinating to me. So I hope everybody enjoys this. Let us know, post in the comments, um, give us a vote, say, yeah, we want Joan again. And we'll have you back on, Joan. I look forward to it. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Um, I love it when people appreciate me because this is a, a new experience for me <laughs> compared to where <laughs> it was. You know, get back in your hole, Joan. <laughs> you know, shut your mouth. Wow. <laughs> you know? I can't believe you were ever in that spot, but it is so inspiring I to was know that. I was suicidal depressive for 15 years. Wow. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And look where you are today. Smiling, well, laughing. And you can tell it's genuine, Joan. There's there's nothing fake about you. Well, thank you. I mean, I had a husband who said he he envied my depression because I I would I could go so low that it also allowed me to go so high. Oh, uh, well. You know, but and the lowness was someone is who, very bad. He was so was always even. Yeah, I said he was like a computer with skin, you know. <laughs> was he boring? That sounds so boring. No, he wasn't boring. He was very oh, creative. Wow. He was he he became an executive at Eyewitness News and and he wow. was fascinating during the I mean during certain things he was the newsman in town and you know, oh, so wow. He sounds like a lucky man that he had that even personality and he was fascinating. Well, he just lost you. That was the only thing he had but that was he bad. he was just as screwed up as everybody is. Because <laughs> we didn't come with a manual. And how yeah. could our parents have known how to deal with this creative being that they birthed? Yes. They, you yeah. know, they, they had all the books to tell them how to do it but the books were wrong. Uh, mm. There were so many things my mother decided to do because she was 
wanted to be a, the best mother and I was the firstborn oh, and wow. missed the mark. <laughs> you know? But wow. you know, so part of the healing is forgiving our parents. They know not yes. what they do. You know, yes. they, they didn't know yeah. any better. My father was right. just as screwed up as anyone else. And so he didn't wake up every morning, say, I'm going to really screw up this kid. They, right. did, they did what they thought was best. And to, yes. to hold on to that, that, that grudge or whatever it is, mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. just doesn't anger. Matter. Yeah. And, and you have mm -hmm. to know that there's another way to look at it. I love that. Well, thank you so much for being on here today. I really appreciate you taking the time to be here and share these insights with us. Well, th and thank you for, for letting me share this. I really appreciate it. And the link to Joan's website and other information, uh, the books that she mentioned, that will all be in our show notes also. Thank you for listening to Dare to Leap. Say hello and access additional resources at virtualexperttraining.com. There you'll be able to connect with Kathy to share your feedback and join her community. Join us again soon on Dare to Leap. Until then. Mm -hmm.